Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So David Zipper perspective on cities and urban mobility is rooted in his experience working within City Hall, as well as being a venture capitalist, policy researcher, and startup advocate. David advises numerous startups, mayors, and transit agencies about the future of urban mobility, and his writing has been published in The Atlantic, Slate, Newsweek, Fast Company, covering topics such as mobility as a service, transit fare payments, and the relationship between transit and ride hail services. He's currently a visiting fellow in, uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School's uh, Center for State and Local Government. So, David, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me back, Harry. Definitely. I uh, appreciate you coming back on for your, your second time. So, obviously, the first one, maybe I wasn't tough on you enough because you're still back for more. Exactly. But I'm sure you'll fix that this time. <laughs> well, I'm really excited to chat with you today because we've got a good topic. Uh, I think that you wrote a recent article, um, and I can read the title off here. We'll link to this in the show notes so that people can read the full article because I think it's a really interesting uh, topic on the driver's side, but also the potential impacts down the road. So your article was titled, Did Uber Just Enable Discrimination by Destination? So my first question is, who came up with that title? It's a good title. <laughs> <laughs> This time, and it doesn't usually work this way for those people who are curious, I actually think I may have come up with a title myself. All uh, right. Because uh, it was honest. That was the genuine yeah. question that I had when I learned about this uh, this change on their driver platform. Yeah, and I think that that's. It. I just wanted to bring that up. It's a little funny, right? Because people always tend to look at the titles, not read the article, and so uh, you know, I always see authors saying, "Oh, you know, it was my editor who came up with this title." So we had to get the bottom of that one. <laughs> yeah, I, it's funny for me. I, I probably would say the last thirty articles I've written, I only came up with the title of maybe like six of them. So, uh, you know, it's, I'm batting 200. <laughs> yeah. So this was a good one you wrote. And uh, I guess what was the, I, I know we had chatted about this issue. What was the impetus for writing this article? Well, I actually give credit to you. I was in Ohio and I couldn't sleep at a hotel. One, uh, <laughs> and I remember just like, uh, you know, as I do once in a while, it's the worst thing you should do probably when you can't sleep. But I was on Twitter okay. sort of refreshing. And I think, uh, you know, I follow uh, you, a rideshare guy, and I think you had just posted um, mm -hmm. an article from a contributor. What was his name, the guy you wrote? the Jay Crater. Yeah. Um, basically saying, hey, this is great. Finally, Uber <laughs> lets us see where passengers want to go before we accept the trip. Like, it was a really excited, positive piece. Yeah. And I remember, like, sit, I, I think I tweeted in the middle of the night responding to it. It was uh, thinking this is actually really dangerous mm -hmm. as uh, this seems like it could enable the kind of discrimination that, frankly, taxis have been accused of for decades. Yeah. And I was really surprised to see the change. And it made me curious about it and sort of led to the article being published only, I guess, about a week later after your blog post went up. Yeah, no, and I think that's right. One of the reasons why I really appreciate your perspective, because obviously we're really coming from the driver's perspective. So yeah. I think it is important to, you know, look at everyone's point of view, this change in particular, kind of like you mentioned, maybe we'll go ahead and, uh, you know, I can kind of explain the details. But I mean, I guess the system, and you do a good job explaining this in your article, but the system before these changes, and it's just in California, which we'll get into the reasons why um, about that later. But basically, the system before was that drivers didn't have a whole lot of information about the trip. I mean, I would even say that uh, many passengers would always remark to me, wow, I can't believe when they found out, I can't believe that you don't know where we're going until you come to pick me up. And so drivers, they know where the passenger is. Um, so just logistically how it works is you go online on the driver app and then you get a ping request and it tells you, okay, this, this passenger is about five minutes away. It's about 10 minutes away. So we call that the ETA. So you know at least how long it's going to take to get there, right? The shorter, the better. And then uh, that you see their rating, you see if it's on surge or not. So you really don't have a ton of information. It's not until you physically arrive at the location and swipe to start the trip, usually when they're getting in the car that you say, oh crap, they're going two hours away. I can't do this trip, <laughs> right? And so that pain point over the years, uh, you know, it's not every situation, it's too long 
of a trip, but sometimes drivers, you know, want to stay online for just another hour before they pick up their kid. And so they don't want long trips or they want short trips or they want long trips, right? There's all these different scenarios where that feature would have come into play. And basically now Uber is allowing drivers and now all drivers in California actually have this feature as of uh, recording. Did I, did I explain that well? Yeah, I think you did. Uh, just a, maybe a couple of clarifying points that I think are worth making. First of all, this is just Uber. It's not Lyft. Yeah. Lyft is not doing this. Not and yet. we're only talking... <laughs> well, I'm sorry? Not yet. Not yet. That's right. They they told me that uh, Lyft did that they had no plans to do this. So yeah, it could happen, but that's what they told me when I spoke with them in the course of writing my article. And I think it's also worth clarifying it's just in California. So if you yeah. live in New York or you're a driver in Atlanta, this is not relevant for you now. It could be in the future, but it's not yeah. now. And I will uh, add on to that, David. Uber told me that if this kind of goes well, that they do plan on rolling it out nationwide, which I think sort of makes sense. We can dig into that more later, but uh, that's another right. interesting no, I, thing I they said. I think we should. Um, and I, and so, so, yeah, I think your explanation is good. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, well, I think maybe, maybe you can speak to this a little bit. This change didn't come out of nowhere. This is something that drivers had asked for for a while, right? I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, I think I, I even tweeted out an article that we wrote five, four or five years ago, like the top seven features drivers would like. And at the top of the list, one, two or three was being able to see where passengers were going. So drivers have definitely been asking for this for forever. And I'm sure it's on a product roadmap somewhere on Uber or Lyft, but it was just something that they never wanted to do or that just wasn't uh, important or priority. But it seems with the passing of AB5 and I mean, they even Uber released a blog post when they released these new features that uh, it literally, I think the first line or two says, because of new laws in California, we sort of had to go or we wanted to go ahead and do right. this. So I wouldn't say that it was completely to benefit. I mean, there are a lot of benefits that drivers are getting out of this, but it seems like the impetus for this change was AB5. Was that your understanding? Yeah, no, definitely. I don't think there's really any, any ambiguity around that. Yeah. But I actually think it might be worth just rewinding real quick, though, to explain mm -hmm. a little bit more about, from maybe from a policy perspective, why, although drivers may not have liked the previous status quo of not knowing where a, where a passenger wants to go, it actually fulfilled some policy goals and some operational goals, I would argue, for both Uber and Lyft. Um, because I actually worked for the mayor of Washington, D.C. when Uber first arrived, like nine yeah. years ago, which was extremely controversial in <laughs> where I live. You know, there's like, I feel like there are all kinds of battle scars and, and from that whole experience. Yeah, that's going to be our, our third podcast when you come on next time. We'll yes. discuss all that. <laughs> really do it. It, was, it was fascinating. By the way, do you know, here's a little side note. Do you know who the, uh, the, the general manager was, like the one in, who was managing Uber's emergence in D.C. in 2011? Uh, was that Rachel Holt? It was. Okay. It was, who later grew on to lead all of North American operations and now yeah. leads all of new mobility for Uber. But she got started right here in DC because she wanted some, a tech job, not a policy job, as she was mm. moving with her oh, partner, interesting. Uh, policy role. It's kind oh. of ironic. Good money anyway, for her. <laughs> yeah, no, no. But one of the things that Rachel and her colleagues would emphasize in those early years for Bride Hill, when I worked in the mayor's office, mm -hmm. was. Look, we're, one of the things we provide that's good for policy and good for residents is that we are not going to ever discriminate against people of color or against people from low-income communities the way that taxis long have. And this yeah. has been a long-standing issue for those Definitely. who are listeners who are younger. I think it's important to mention, <laughs> you know, I remember back in like the late 90s, Danny Glover, the lethal weapon actor, was doing like sting operations with taxis in New York City pointing out how he'd be, he'd be with like a friend who was white and the taxi would go right past Danny Glover waiting, trying to get a taxi, go straight to the white person and pick mm. that person up. This yeah. became a huge wow. issue, longstanding issues of racism and potentially you could, it's maybe it's just flat out racism or maybe it's, it's not wanting to go to neighborhoods where people of color are presumed to live, but, but it's hard. I mean, whatever, either way, it's not legal, but it happened all the time. And what, what Uber and Lyft have been able to say historically is, look, we don't do that because mm -hmm. the drivers don't know where they're going when they, pick, right. when, they uh, when they accept a ride. So, and that actually really matters to, to, from a policy perspective. It's been mm -hmm. point in ride hail's favor. 
And I actually think it's also helped create sort of like the smooth market that Uber and Lyft have wanted, where you're able, yeah. wherever you are, you can pretty much assume wherever you want to go, you know, you'll be able to get a ride. So I think yeah. it's, I want to make a couple of points about what was good, I would argue, about the previous status quo, even though drivers may not have liked it. Yeah. Well, I actually really think those are important points. Two things that come to mind is one, I think we've sometimes sort of taken that for granted, right? The fact that Uber and Lyft will take you anywhere and everywhere, right? Like, I feel like a lot of consumers or customers, they just expect that now. And so it's almost like, I don't know how much credit Uber and Lyft are getting for that these days, because it's sort of now we expect it. And then the second thing is that right. I think it's, it's really an interesting challenge to kind of balance the short term needs of a driver. Like if I'm a driver and I'm going out today, I don't want to take a ride that's going to take me to an area where I can't get a return trip, right? Kind of like what you were talking about, but I'm doing it with a short term frame of mind because I need to make a hundred dollars today so that I can cash that money out at the end of the night and pay my rent. <laughs> but if there's too much of that, right, the service as a whole becomes more unreliable and, you know, maybe the brand and uh, Uber itself, the brand, you know, starts to deteriorate and it's not, you know, it doesn't become an option that customers default to, which over time leads to less rides, which over time means that I make less money. But that's a much longer term, you know, sort of outcome versus like kind of my short term needs as a driver. I don't know if there's, uh, you know, a, the best way to balance that or make drivers think about it. But I think it's definitely a big challenge to kind of help, you know, drivers understand that in this context. No, I think I think you make really good points. And I think, you know, in a world without AB5, for the reasons that we're talking about, I, I personally don't see Uber making this change. Yeah. Even if drivers have asked for it for years, as you've said, I don't see Uber doing it. But AB5 comes along, as as, mm -hmm. as, alluded, as you alluded to earlier. Um, and I think does everybody, people understand what AB5 is, I assume, right? Uh, we, we can, maybe you can give a, I, I mean, I guess AB5, we've, we've done lots of interviews on the podcast about it, but if not, I mean, it basically is saying, you know, that drivers in California are going to need to be classified as employees. And as you point out in your article, Uber and Lyft have basically said, uh, hell no to that. We don't want, we don't want, no, <laughs> we don't want right. that. And so, you know, and this is and, and Uber in there and it's frankly, it's also interesting. Uber made this change by announcing it to you, rideshare guy, <laughs> and in its own blog post, it did not do a press release. Yeah. And the blog post was only to California drivers. There was no big press release. There was no any kind of publicity really around the change, which maybe suggests they knew there was going to be potential for blowback against this. But what what Uber um, what, what what Uber said is, you know, we want to give more knowledge and information to drivers so they can decide for every trip whether or not that you, you know you want to accept it. And and that sort of makes sense from an AB5 perspective because, you know, if Uber is arguing that drivers are fundamentally contractors, it sort of is weird to say, oh, they make independent decisions on every trip with full information yeah. when the drivers don't even know where they're, they would be going before right. they accept the trip. It's just weird. So that, that sort of makes sense to make this sort of a shift in that way. So, so just to be clear, what Uber is doing, we should probably be clear about this, and, maybe, and, and I'll start you, I'm sure you'll have thoughts too, mm -hmm. is you know, as of this month, January 20, uh, 2020, when we're recording this, pretty much, the, according to Uber, every driver in California, now when they get a, uh, a request, a ping, they'll be able to see the origin and the de desired destination of the person that's requesting it, and importantly, uh, no longer would a driver be penalized for rejecting or turning down as many trips as they like. They would not lose access to the rewards program for drivers known yeah. as Uber Pro. Um, and I believe, do they get other information too that's new? You would know better than I perhaps on this. Yeah, I mean, so really, you know, so drivers have never, well, not never, but over the past few years, they haven't been technically penalized. So they call this the acceptance rate, right? So you get 10 right. trips, you accept, let's say eight, you now have an 80% acceptance rate. You weren't, you could have a 0% acceptance rate technically and not be deactivated, but they did require, I think, an 85% acceptance rate to become a part of Uber Pro, which I think think at, at, at first, you know, actually gave you more money. <laughs> um, so that was right. very valuable, but they took that feature away. So there's some benefits and there's some features of Uber Pro that uh, drivers, you know, want to maintain that status, but it's not uh, life or death, you know, make or break your career kind of rewards or status. You can kind of still get by without right. it. So 
I think, do you think we've done kind of a good job explaining the logistics sort of how it was before and how it was after? Because I think now, like you said, right now, drivers can basically see where passengers are going, right? Is there anything else as far as the logistics? Yeah. Yeah. I think in California now, right. for the, it's a huge change in my view. Drivers can now see, you know, John Doe wants to go to this, to this location. So that, that, that means a couple different things. Um, it means, first of all, a driver can tell, you know, how long the trip would be. Yeah. All else being equal, longer trips are more lucrative. So it could be that a longer trip, a driver might say, oh, you know, it'll take me 12 minutes to get over there, but this person wants to go 35 miles, so it's worth right. it. Whereas before this change went into effect, say in you know November of last year, they wouldn't have known that that was a 35-mile trip. So they probably would have said, I don't want to go 12 minutes to go pick this person up. What if they only want to go a mile? Yeah. So that so maybe longer trips get 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 chosen more easily, but it's not just the the length of uh, the the duration of the trip that people now know drive drivers now know. It's also the ultimate destination. Mm-hmm. That opens up some some questions, a lot of questions in terms of you know our, I would argue with my my sort of policy hat on. Mm-hmm. It opens up questions about what's going to happen for people who are living in low income uh, minority communities that might actually legitimately have less demand for another ride hail trip compared with, say, a downtown uh, hotspot in the evening. But those people just want to get home. Like, there's nothing wrong with wanting to take an Uber to get (laughs) home wherever you live. And I think there is the potential, potential for drivers to make a pattern, at least some of those drivers, of declining trips that bring them to low-income minority communities. And if that happens, that's a major policy problem, and it's something that I would argue regulators are going to need to respond to. Yeah. I mean, I'll even take it one step further and say that I think we can, you know, uh, like you said, I, I know we're kind of talking in hypotheticals, but I think there's a good chance. I think I can, we can safely assume that there is going to be some form of discrimination. I wrote an article a few years ago, actually, um, about uh, rideshare drivers when there was some studies coming out about whether or not they were racist. And one of the things, one of the graphs I presented in that was actually kind of socioeconomic status mapped with Uber and Lyft's bonus zones, where they're telling drivers to go and where they're telling drivers to go, especially in a city like Los, uh, Los Angeles, for example, or Santa Monica, West Hollywood, downtown, uh, South Bay. What do all of those areas have in common? You know, they're very expensive, right? That's where a lot of the rides are. That's where a lot of the action is. And so if you're going outside of those areas as a driver, it's going to be less busy. And that is where, you know, lower socioeconomic areas lie. So I think that, you know, it is important to kind of preface it and sort of say that uh, we, we don't know for sure, but I do think that it's definitely something people should pay attention to because I have a pretty good feeling it's going to happen. So I guess my question to you would be what, I mean, I guess is, you know, without being too harsh, I mean, like, what are the, the downsides, right? Like if I'm, uh, you know, a driver, for example, and I don't want to go to an area because I'm not going to get a return trip, is that necessarily, you know, it, it's almost like, I, like, I guess there's certain cases of direct racism where, you know, if you skip over a passenger who's uh, black to pick up someone up who's white, I think that most people will agree is not okay. But what about those more gray area where I would say if I'm a driver and I don't want to go to a lower socioeconomic area, not because of the passenger, but because I won't be able to get a return trip more because of the financial reasons. What do you think about that? Well, I would argue two different ways. I would say, first of all, uh, according to Uber's own community uh, standards, that you can't do that. Mm-hmm. Like Uber has community standards that explicitly say, and I'm quoting now, it is not acceptable to discriminate on the basis of a rider's destination or a customer's delivery location. Got it. So if there's a pattern of that behavior of driver X systematically declining trips to, um, you know, pick whatever neighborhood you want. I don't even yeah. want to say one. Um, suppose that that goes against Uber's rules. And I spoke to people at Uber who didn't want to be quoted, but they, they said uh, that, this, that they would take action against drivers who did mm-hmm. that. It happened. The question is, I don't know what the standard is. They wouldn't say what the standard was for to, to yeah. take it. Well, and, there is no standard yet. <laughs> right, right. And what's the penalty? Is it just yeah. a slap on the wrist? Is it like, I, the, the, you know, that's a question. But that, that's how Uber, that's a question of how Uber would manage it itself. 
from a policy making perspective, you know, this is becomes a question of what we as re, res, as being part of society feel like we uh, we owe each other with regards to our mobility network. Mm-hmm. And this is why it's not legal for a taxi driver to go past an African American person to pick up a white person. That's flat out illegal. Yeah. It's also illegal for a taxi driver in New York, say, to uh, when you hail one, to say, "Hey, where do you want to go?" Mm-hmm. Before, and then drive off if they don't want to go where you want to go. That, these things happen all the time, yeah. but it's illegal, and you can be reported for it. A driver can be, and they can be penalized. And the reasons we have rules like that are because we think that no matter where you live. In, a, in an urban area, you deserve an equal access to various forms of mobility, including including taxi or ride hail service. Ride hail, mm-hmm. I'm only bringing up for the first time, really, in these conversations because, you know, it's never been a problem before. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. So, so I I, you know, I spoke with some regulators, including the former um, director of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission, who said, yeah, I mean, it, like, it, with a, if a change like this happened in New York, which by the way could happen. Because yeah. New York State is one of those that's considering legislation along the lines of AB five, well, then then one of the, something that that the uh, Taxi Limousine Commission could do is to say, look, well, we we want to protect New Yorkers' rights to have equal access to ride hail among other forms of mobility. So we're going to start for the first time collecting data, mandating collecting data mm-hmm. from the ride hail companies to show acceptance and rejection data from drivers based on location and yeah. we'll penalize the providers if people say in east new york which is a lower income community in, in brooklyn are getting declined for their trips far more frequently than those are who live in manhattan yeah that, that's a real thing that could happen i would say and uh, frankly it's a reasonable thing to have happen yeah, no, and I want to dig into the data side and how you might actually enforce this. Before we move on, I think I, I wouldn't say that you've convinced me, but I'm thinking that we're actually, you know, somewhat on the same page because the way you explained it, I mean, basically it's, I think it makes sense that it's illegal for me as a driver that I can't not take someone to a certain part of town because it's unprofitable, let's say. I guess where it gets a little tricky is how do you balance that with, you know, whether it's, you know, kind of a profitable ride for you in general, not right? Like when you hire, like I'm hiring right now a taco cart for my son's birthday. And because they're a certain, I'm too far, I'm outside their 25 mile distance. So they're charging me an extra $75, right? And so I guess, how do you balance that sort of, you know, like who pays for, that extra time or that extra distance. Yeah. Does that make sense? Well, and, and I would I would suggest, Harry, I think it's it's a challenge not just for ride hail, but it's a question really for a variety of of uh, almost any private mobility service. Yeah. I would draw a parallel, frankly, to scooters mm-hmm. and how a number of cities like Oakland have begun requiring minimum per, uh, fleets to be deployed in, at say six a.m. every day in low income communities. Yeah. Those communities are going to probably have less demand per capita for, for scooter trips, mm-hmm. but it's important that they be distributed. So that becomes a relative expense that the a company like Bird or Lime, or for that matter, Uber or Lyft, because they've got yeah. micro mobility company services too, they just sort of, sort of have to amortize across their overall system. So what I would what I myself would argue, and this is just David speaking, is that you know if there's you know, who who actually bears the 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 the, the cost of the fact that a trip to a low-income community might be less profitable for the driver than one going downtown. Well, frankly, it's on Uber and Lyft to make sure that they're compensating people appropriately and so that so that uh, the drivers are okay. But ultimately, what really matters from a policy perspective, I would put forth, is the mobility access of, of, of the people who are trying to travel. And it is an Uber and Lyft, ultimately, in my view, that they provide an equal opportunity to mobility, regardless of, of where in a city you live and what co- the color is of your skin. And frankly, I, I think that's always been the case. It's just now with this change in, that, in, in Uber's platform in California, it suddenly becomes a bigger question yeah. of whether Uber might fail to meet that threshold. Yeah, so it sounds like you think that it's kind of Uber and Lyft's responsibility to figure out the system that would yeah. kind of not enforce, but sort of make it worth driver's while to do 
all of these various trips, whether yeah. it's downtown or whether it's out into the suburbs, right? Carrots and sticks, right? You yeah. could be extra, extra money if you're going to an area that has low, that has, you know, you might have to wait a yeah. little bit longer for another ride. Or it could be sticks being like, look, if you show a pattern, and this is what, what a pattern means of declining trips to these areas, mm -hmm. you're off. You're off the okay. platform. I mean, but I actually think and that could be something that cities and and uh, and regulators, because in California, this is important. It's the state that regulates ride hail, not right. cities. That's an important. CPUC, state. yeah. Exactly. Um, the California Public Utilities Commission, for those who may not know the abbreviation. So mm -hmm. that's so so that may be something where CPU. If I'm if I'm at the CPUC, I'm watching this really carefully. And thinking, okay, do I now need to have a whole different way of keeping an eye on Uber and Lyft and, and basically applying penalties if they're failing to meet these sort of social goals that we have in, in, in the Golden State, something like that? Yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. And that's sort of where regulators step into the picture. I think the two things that come to mind, though, is number one, regulators are kind of understaffed. I just saw an article, a pretty in-depth uh, uh, kind of report, I guess you would almost call it uh, today from the San Francisco Free Press, I believe it was called. I'll leave a link in the show notes, but they sort of were looking at some of the safety issues around the vehicles that Uber and Lyft are using. And a couple right. of the quotes that stood out to me from the CPUC was basically just that we don't have enough people <laughs> to, to regulate these multi-billion dollar companies. So it seems like that could be one challenge. And then the second thing is what you touched on earlier is they don't even have the data to you know they, they couldn't regulate this even if they wanted to right because they sort of need to have that data fight and at least start getting some of that information and the acceptance rates and all of that first that right it, right i mean that could be a new data set they require mm -hmm. um uh which would make sense but i also let, let's let's be candid you know california is one of many states in the u.s where uber and lyft have done a very good job of taking regulatory oversight away from the cities where the vast majority of their trips yeah. and and put that oversight at the state level so mm -hmm. uh you know my heart does not bleed for uber <laughs> if they have a tough time fulfilling new requirements that come at the state level because yeah. oh no I, I think we agree there i know i think they definitely need to you know i i guess i'm i think they need more regulation i'm just it's sort of like one trend i've noticed from the outside it's like no one really like this is like picking a big fight with a big bad boxer right like no one really wants to get into this fight this battle on the regulation side and i mean i understand why um, but someone does need to do it well i guess what i would say with this, with this one harry like I think it's pretty much a norm in almost any city I can think of that taxis and cities mm -hmm. still have taxis, you know, they are held to a, to a standard that explicitly bars them from, you know, discrimination based on race. Right. Yeah. So there's, there's some experience that, that regulators should have of enforcing that and keeping an eye on it. Um, certain cities like New York city and Chicago, DC, where I live still do that. But in other ways, it's going to be more at the state level. But it just may be that that perhaps per, so perhaps it's not starting from scratch with Ride Hill, and maybe that that some groups need to uh, sort of like dust off the regs they have for me, <laughs> yeah, being against racism, which has been ongoing for just decades in taxis, and applying some of those standards or some of that oversight to Ride Hill for the first time, at least to Uber, because again, Lyft isn't doing this yet. We'll see what happens. Yeah. So one of the sort of interesting kind of back and forth that I'm seeing here is that Uber is shifting, you know, they're not happy with AB5, right? So they're now shifting their drivers to be kind of more like true independent contractors. And actually just this morning, Uber released some new features that I'll share with you later that kind of uh, now couple what uh, passengers are paying to what drivers are getting just some small some small stuff on the driver's side to make it even more seem like you know they're actually just a marketplace right so right. they're not done with uh, these changes to I guess the platform that you would call it and this is California only but at the same time you know some of these uh, I, I guess regulations like right if you're going out like how do you balance what uber is trying to do and say that they're a marketplace just connecting drivers and riders with actually enforcing it on uber you know what i mean like 
if Uber is just a marketplace connecting drivers and riders, shouldn't you be enforcing it with drivers? Like, how do you think regulators might balance? I think Uber is the one who you want to go to, but it's sort of like, I almost see it like now from the other side, like from Uber's perspective, like, wow, we're now treating our drivers like independent contractors, but now the regulators are like, you know, making us do all these things <laughs> to drivers, or is it, that's just their responsibility? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I think that's sort of what lies behind AB5 at the most basic level is this sort of sense from its proponents that at the end of the day, it's Uber's responsibility. Like the mm -hmm. drivers work for Uber, right? I think you would yeah. agree with that. I know you have some... Well, I, I definitely agree with that now, but I mean, the more they shift into an... If they continue to shift into an actual marketplace, I think the less I would agree with that. Um, we'll see. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I, I think... I mean, AB5 is, is Uber's got, got a pretty high hill to climb to reverse mm -hmm. AB5, right? Yeah. It's yeah. possible, but in California, it's going to be hard to do from everything I've seen. So given that, that the law of, of the state is that, um, you know, drivers really are full-time employees for Uber by and large, Uber and Lyft, I, I mean, in, to get back to your earlier question, to me, the natural extension is to say, okay, it's on Uber, not on the drivers, yeah. to ensure that, that the drivers are not discriminating. It's Uber's responsibility. Yeah, um, That feels like it's the underlying attitude of AB5 is to say, like, sorry, Uber and Lyft, you're responsible in a way that you may not have wanted, but that's just how it's going to be. And to yeah. me, that implies you're responsible not just for, for you know, how people are compensated, your, your drivers are, but also you're responsible for, for, uh, for, for avoiding discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. So I think the last kind of topic uh, or aspect of this topic that I want to hit on, and then of course, if we miss anything, let me know. But I, I mean, as far as I guess the best solution to fix this, it seems like from what we've discussed so far, that regulators need some data. They kind of need some yeah. insight from Uber uh, and maybe Lyft if Lyft starts doing something similar. Uh, what do you see? Do you have any ideas as to how you know, is this system something that it would just won't work like this? Or what, what do you think? So that is the, the question. What's the next step? I think yeah. if it was, so again, I, I live in Washington, D.C. I'm not a Californian. But if I were in California now and I was a regulator, I'd be concerned. I, I think now is when CPUC should be observing this change and saying, all right, we, we now need to start collecting acceptance and rejection by destination data from mm -hmm. the ride companies and have capacity to interpret it. So maybe you go back to the state assembly and get more funding for it or whatever, but that's something that they're going to need to start doing. But I also think that that what we're probably going to see, I would I would hope, uh, is uh, some studies that will be done by some thoughtful academics, because California has some great universities for transportation yeah. research, Berkeley, UC Davis, Stanford too. Um, and basically, just this is not a hard thing to, <clears throat> to figure out. You can create dummy accounts or whatever and say let's see if it's if i'm mm -hmm. getting if my trips if the, if the origin is exactly the same mm -hmm. in san francisco and there are some destinations that are you know at, at san francisco airport that are some that are three miles away still in san francisco and there are some that are in a lower income community in in oakland do those does that that final group get rejected more frequently that's not a hard study to do and i yeah. suspect it's going to happen and the findings from it, I hope, get public. I'm sure mm -hmm. they will, actually. Yeah, and I think I, they might. <laughs> yeah, seriously, right? Um, but I think that if it, if it suggests what you and I are both worried about, which is there will be a discriminatory effect, well, then I think then it's maybe going to light a bit more fire under CPUC to say, look, you guys got to really be on top of this. Yeah. And, and I think it's going to, mean, you know, this is a small community of mobility regulators nationwide, I have to think when I, in fact, I should, I should note when I wrote my article in December, nobody on the policy side I spoke to had any idea that Uber made this change in California. Nobody so you're knew. saying that they don't subscribe to the rideshare guy. I, well, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe <that>. they should. <laughs> right? Seriously. Um, but, uh, but I think that, that, you know, that the first study that comes out along the lines mm -hmm. of just mentioning, or if, if uh, you know, and I think with my article as well, I hope I help with this, the genie's out of the bottle a little bit, the, yeah. there's more tension that if Uber makes this change, like you said, not nationwide, or even just in a state like New York that they're worried about with regards to an AB5 copycat legislation, yeah. uh, then I think, you know, that's when you've got to see regulators outside of California step up pretty quickly. 
And I hope that I think there's something to watch. Frankly, this is one of the ride hill themes I think should be watched closely in 2020. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I would even say one thing you said earlier in the conversation that stood out to me is that, you know, if we're thinking, you know, Uber is going to be responsible for this, I don't think it's that difficult to start developing some, you know, I, I don't think they're going to do it immediately. But once they've sort of, you know, had these new features out there and they've kind of figured out, you know, some more things with AB5 to start sort of self-regulating. And I think it, regulators still need to be there, but I, I think that it's not going to be a, an impossible challenge for Uber to sort of start seeing, hey, where are our drivers going and to sort of start imposing, you know, maybe potential little penalties here and there, like they've done yeah. in the past, if drivers are, you know, accepting trips and, you know, sort of saying, Hey, this is the law. You can't break this law. Right. Yeah. I think that's right. I mean, my impression is Uber is sort of curious to see how this goes, mm -hmm. how much attention it gets, how much blowback it gets. So I think you're right. Uber has tools it could use if it wants to. Um, but it'll be it'll be interesting to experience. And I guess the, one of the last, if I could, one of the last points yeah. I might make is, um, you know, you, for the listeners of the podcast who are in California, keep an eye out. If you if you take Uber, um, you know, if you're visiting or or if you reside in a low income or minority community, and you're, it seems like it's harder to get a, a trip, you're waiting longer than before. Let people know. Tweet about it. Tweet to yeah. tweet to me. Tweet to you. <laughs> um, but also. And, and this is one we skipped over, but it's worth mentioning too. It's not just about the effect on low income or minority communities. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be an impact. You and I have talked about this before. There's likely to be an impact on just longer and shorter trips. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you you just are in downtown San Francisco and you want to go to the mission or something. It's a short trip. That actually is maybe less lucrative and less desirable conceivably. Maybe that's a bad yeah. example because those are high demand areas. But shorter trips might get more discrimination. Maybe a better example is, let's say you live in in uh, South San Francisco and you fly into Seto Airport. That's a short yeah. trip. You very well might get Uber drivers who say, you know what, I'm just going to wait until somebody wants to go into the city or into Oakland or whatever, or San Jose. So that's something else to keep an eye on is whether um, Californians are experiencing longer waits when they want to take shorter trips. And perhaps on the plus side, yeah. it, have shorter waits if you're taking longer trips because more drivers will be eager to, to serve you. These are all things that I hope people will in California or I invite people in California who take Uber regularly to, to just observe and even if anecdotal, let people know what you're seeing. I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. Well, is that kind of discrimination bad? I mean, I totally understand, right? If you're discriminating based off lower socioeconomic areas, but if you're just discriminating, you know, uh, some rich guy <laughs> because they're going on a short trip. Is that a bad thing? Right. I, I think it's a bad thing. So I don't know that it's illegal. Usually, you know, right. People who live close to airports are not a protected class the way. Exactly. I, that's a good point, right? Like that's a perfect example. <laughs> or LGBTQ groups are like, right. that's different. Um, but it's bad for Uber. Like how annoyed yeah. would you be? If you fly into an airport and, and you live close by and you can't get a ride home because it's not because you happen to have a home that's only two miles from right. the airport, that's that takes away from the liquidity of the marketplace yeah. that Uber wants. Yeah. Right? And, and that's why, you know, I, I really I, I'm kind of now even strengthening my opinion that I do think Uber needs to be responsible for a lot of this because individual driver, right, giving them the power to raise or lower prices in that situation just seems like a nightmare. But if Uber, for example, sees that, OK, you know, passengers in this, you know, this non-protected class of short airport trip <laughs> goers, we want them to be able to get a ride. We need to just charge them more like that seems like the simplest solution to me versus that won't work as well if they're going to low, lower socioeconomic economic areas do we want to just charge them more probably not that's right that's right i mean and it's frankly there's you know taxis have dealt with these issues for decades yeah. harry so so i remember when i uh by flying into new york when i was uh, you know a lot younger and visiting grandparents who lived close to jfk um you know what what, what happen is if you get a taxi that's only going to bring you just a couple miles into queens or you know when you fly in instead of going to Manhattan, that is, which is much more expensive and lucrative, the yeah. taxi driver would get, I think it was called like a shorty pass, maybe yeah. you still get it, which brings you the front of the queue when they come yeah. back. Like, so Uber actually has a system just like that <laughs> already <laughs> at some airports. Solution. But yeah. I think where you and I are both going is to say, you know, it's kind of on Uber to figure that part out. Yeah. If For those who want short trips and are not sort of like a protected class, if you will, 
Um, where I see more of like the policymakers stepping in because I do worry about whether Uber will step in aggressively yeah. enough to protect their rights is when you're talking about people who live in low income communities. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if I think if I could summarize this podcast in a couple sentences, I'm <laughs> going to say that I think there's definitely potential for some issues and maybe even some big issues. Uber has the tools and the capability to kind of preemptively fix it. Will they do it or not? I think that's a big question. And if not, most likely regulators are going to need to step in. How does that sound? I think that sounds pretty good. Uh, I think that regulators need to be aware of this. And um, and just as someone I know you love Ride Hail and I think Ride Hail has done some good things. I just would be sad to see Ride Hail lose one of the really clear advantages society yeah. it's had over taxis over the last decade. Yeah. That would be that would be unfortunate. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on and share your perspective is because I've been telling, I don't want a few kind of bad apples, you know, a few drivers who are abusing or taking advantage of this program to ruin it for the 99%. So I'm really glad you could come Good on point. and uh, discuss this. I know you're active on Twitter, so we'll uh, leave a link or you can share your Twitter handle. Where, where can people follow your work and follow your stuff? Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm, I'm always interested in these sorts of, of societal questions around new mobility technologies like Ride Hill. Um, I tweet it at David Zipper, and uh, I am always interested. I have many back and forth with you, Harry, and I always welcome uh, interesting uh, suggestions or arguments, wherever they may be. Awesome. Thanks, David. Thank you. It's a pleasure.